Happy Sabbath, church. Still having some problems. Is that better? Almost there? I think we're there. Happy Sabbath once again. I hope you have uh, been blessed so far. I was just taking some notes here of all the things that have been happening and some of the words that the ladies just sang. Wherever I go, there you are. My heart can't escape your loving embrace. And I just want to meditate on those words because wherever we go in this life, we know that our God always is there. And I just want to thank the ladies this morning and all of those that took part in the service. Thank you so much. Uh, as you know, we are running behind just a little bit and I'm going to try to get through uh, everything here in due time. As you know, for the last little while, for almost this year, uh, we've been focusing on various passages that are very important and they're very pertinent to us as Seventh-day Adventists. Have we not? And so I wanted to focus today on one of those messages that are uh, very specific uh, to us uh, as a church and to every individual under the sound of my voice. I know there are some individuals watching online and some who may be here for the first time. Uh, this may be a new message to you, but, but us as Adventists, uh, we believe in the sanctuary message, don't we? And there are some very important things I wanted to highlight about the sanctuary message. I know I'm, I'm short for time, so if you would bear with me, I'm going to try to be mindful of that and finish in the next few minutes. But I want to give you and unpack exactly what God has given to me. Is that all right? Man, you're very quiet today. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I'm really hoping that this message would cheer you up like it did to me. Um, so without any further ado, let us turn to the Word of God this morning. And it was read very eloquently by Lily this morning, but I want to just focus again for emphasis sake on chapter 25 of Exodus and verses 8 to 10. Very briefly, verses 8 to 10. Once again, when you have it, say amen. 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 Let us read together. It says, And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you, you, just so you shall make it. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. For the next little while, I'll speak to you on the topic, the risen lamb, the risen lamb. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, I ask today that you will speak a word to us. Lord, I ask that you will use this lump of clay once again before your people. Lord, may they be seen, may your name be seen, may, may your name be lifted up like never before. And may each person under the sound of my voice know that you are the risen lamb. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So for those who have been following throughout this year, you have known that I've talked about the state of the dead and the Sabbath message and the second coming we're focused a bit on the millennium and heaven, did we not? Yes. Now, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the sanctuary. Now, I'm following up because this is a previous message that was, was spoken by, by Elder Dean, who talked about the 2300-day prophecy. And um, as, as a church, we believe in the 2300 days, and, and we know that it highlights certain events in Christian history. And you can go back and refer to that message. I'm not going to touch that today. I'm just going to touch on some of the, the services in the sanctuary and how that applies to our lives. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, now, the good thing about the sanctuary, can I just, I'm going to try to be brief. I'm trying to encapsulate everything that's going through my mind right now. I've read so many books, so many articles on the sanctuary uh, for the last couple of weeks in pre preparation for this message. And, and now I'm trying to concise everything so that we can leave here with the relevant information. Is that all right? But that not only is it information that's going into our minds, but that it's going to actually change our lives. Because the sanctuary message is one that's supposed to change our lives. It's supposed to change the way that we live. 
And why? How, do, how, do, how, how, how can I say something like that? Because the sanctuary message actually tells us about the pre-advent judgment. It tells us about the investigative judgment. It tells us about God's exit. Ex executive judgment or, or the final judgment that God will do. Now you may ask the question, what in the world is that, Pastor? What in the world is that? Well, well, God's investigative judgment, that means that some people are thinking that they're going to wait for when Jesus comes back and then they're going to get their self ready. And the sanctuary message tells us that you can't wait until Jesus returns for you to get yourself ready. You've got to be ready right now. And if you're not ready right now, well, you better change your life so that you can be in a place that when Christ comes, he will find you ready. So that's the message of the sanctuary. Now, 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 the message of the sanctuary points to certain dates. It tells us that Jesus was going to come, uh, it, uh, it's going to come, that Jesus was going to be, be there the first time, that is, and then he's going to start his ministry. The time frame exactly points out when Jesus would start his ministry in AD 27. It points out all of that. You can go back and research it for myself, for yourself. Don't take my word for it. It tells us exactly when Jesus Christ was going to die. The sanctuary message. It tells us exactly when the message will change because it first came only to Jews. And when that switched to, to those, those who are Gentiles. It tells us exactly when those things would happen. But then, but then, it goes on further to tell us when God's executive judgment will happen in the future it tells us that the investigative judgment will happen sometime in the past and we know that as a church we believe that in 1844 that ministry actually started that shows you through the sanctuary message the, the sanctuary message also shows us the millennium the millennium and the end of the devil the end of sin, the end of Satan, who has been on our backs like he's been on some people's backs this week. I can see in your faces. And I'm telling you that when you look at the sanctuary message, I'm looking at my time and I know it's getting to me. But, but, but please tell me, can you give me some more minutes? Let me just unwrap this thing. God gave Moses a pattern. And I read the scripture. God gave Moses a pattern and it had to be exact. He gave him a picture of the sanctuary. And in that sanctuary, there had to be, a, it was a miniature model of the heavenly sanctuary. So we as a church, we believe that there is a sanctuary in heaven. And then there is an earthly sanctuary, which is, which is made with human hands, but the sanctuary in heaven is made with the hands of God. And so the beautiful thing is that the sanctuary on earth was a picture of the one in heaven. Now, although it was miniature, there were three types of, of, of sanctuaries that were made upon this earth. Three types of, of sanctuaries, temples. And the first was built by Moses that they had while they were traveling in the wilderness. Then the other was built by Solomon. And that one was, was destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the people and destroyed the temple and took them into captivity. That was the second sanctuary. Then the third one was, was when they came back after their, their captivity. When they came back, they rebuilt the temple in 457 BC. And they were preaching about that. All the prophets were talking about that. And then Herod now came and refurbished that sanctuary. He came and he redid it. He made it even more, more, more grand. And so it became known as Herod's temple. Herod's temple or Herod's sanctuary. And before long, that sanctuary itself was also destroyed. And we know that the sanctuary was never rebuilt after that time. The sanctuary forever is now destroyed. The only thing left of that sanctuary is, is the foundation walls. Is the foundation, just one wall of the foundation. That's the only thing that it has. Now, what did the sanctuary look like? And we all know this, but I'm going to ask them if they can put the picture up. What did the sanctuary look like? There are three main parts of the sanctuary. Three main parts. The first is called the courtyard. The court, which is... Now we can look to various texts in Exodus chapter 29 and verses 8. It tells us what was contained in the courtyard, at least one of the, the items, the furniture items in the courtyard. Exodus chapter 29 and verses 18, verses 18, it tells us there that the altar of burnt offering was one of the furniture in the court. Then there was always fire on that altar. 
The second instrument that was there is called the laver. And that's in Exodus chapter 30 and verses 18. And that instrument was used for ceremonial washing. So the priest will wash in the laver before he was able to perform the services in the sanctuary. The second apartment or the second compartment in the tabernacle is the holy place. And the holy place had three pieces of furniture. The first is the golden lampstand or the candlesticks, and it was always lit. Why was it always lit? Because it was dark inside of that component. If you go back to it, it was always dark in there. The next slide will show you that, that it was always dark in there, so there always had to be light inside of the tabernacle or the sanctuary. And so there was the candlesticks in there. Then the second piece of furniture was the table of showbread. And the table of showbread always had bread on it, uh, representing, of course, the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then the next was the altar of incense, which was always burning. And when it was burning, it was representative of the prayers of the saints. I hope I'm not losing you now. It was representative of the prayers of the saints. And then we move from the court into the holy, and now from the holy to the most holy. But before you get into the most holy, there was a veil that separated the holy from the most holy. And that veil, now, before that, after that veil, you go into the most holy place. And inside of the holy place, you will find only one piece of furniture. Does anyone know what that piece of furniture is? The Ark of the Covenant, you all are right there. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verses 1 to 4, it describes to us the Ark. Now, inside of the Ark, does anyone know what's inside of the Ark? The Ten Commandments, what else? Aaron's rod that budded, what else? Manna, a pot of manna, three items that are found inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Why are they there? Why are they there? Well, I'll get to that in a little bit. You hold on to that then. Understand that there was no light in the most holy place. The light was found inside of the holy place. Did I not say that? Because the candlesticks were there and it always had to be lit. But when you got into the most holy place, which is the other compartment through the veil and into the most holy place, it was supposed to be dark, but it was not. It was always lit. Why was it lit? Not from the candlesticks. That was in the other compartment because the presence of God was there. So the ark was there and you know on top of the ark there was the cherubims that faced each other on top of the ark. And then in the middle of the cherubims was called the mercy seat. So you all are right there with me. You all are good Adventists. Now, now here's the thing. We're moving on. Why was God so insistent that you must build me a sanctuary? Because he wanted to dwell, right? All right. God teaches us who he is through the sanctuary. You all have it. Psalm 77 and verses 13. Now, when I looked up all of this stuff, I went to and read all this stuff, I found some things and I'm going to share with you three major items today and then I'm going to sit down and shut my mouth. Is that okay? The first I'm going to share with you is, is the, if the sanctuary service shows the effect of sin and the process of repentance, forgiveness, and mercy. That's my first point. The second is to show the link between the Old Testament sacrificial service and the events of the cross. I hope you've got my second point. And then the third is to show the eschatological or the prophetic events regarding our salvation. So the last day events is going to show, the sanctuary service shows the last day events and how the plan of salvation actually is effected in our lives. So here we go. Can we go now? All right. We're able to see that God trying to, trying to save man and redeem us from sin throughout the sanctuary service. The sanctuary service represented the work of Jesus on earth and the heavenly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary for sinful mankind from creation until now. From creation until now, we all sin. Did we not? Yes. We sin almost every day. Someone says that's a lie. I sin every day. Yes. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, Adam and Eve, when they sinned to hide their shame and their nakedness, what did they do? They got what? They got leaves. What did God do? God said, hold up. 
These leaves are not sufficient. You sinned, and because you sinned, something has to die. And God asked Adam and Eve to go out there and get a lamb and kill the lamb and to use the skin for their covering. I hope you see something now because the, some people believe that the sanctuary service only existed when Moses came on the scene and God said, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell. And then they started the sanctuary service of bringing in a lamb and slitting a throat and all that stuff. And we're going to go through that in a second. But the service actually started from the Garden of Eden. So way back when, now some scholars actually say, now listen to this, some scholars say that it was God who did the first killing. And I said, wait a minute, no it can't be, because when you look at the service itself, it was not the, the, the priest that did the killing. You guys know that, right? Okay, I need two individuals, I'm going to try and go through this thing real, real quick. I need two individuals, if you would please, please just come with me. I'm just trying to, trying, to, trying to work with the program here. I've seen the time, and I'm trying to work with the program. I just need two volunteers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you be the priest? Sure. Can you be the sinner? Sure. Wonderful. I need a lamb. Please come. Please come. I told you I'm going to get kind of real here today, right? Because, because I realize the time, and after doing all these, these reading, I don't have the time. Avene, thank you so much. Now, you are the lamb. Okay. He's a sinner. He's a low-down, dirty sinner. He found out that he did sin, similar to Genesis 22, where Abraham was taking his only son. Now, that's a beautiful picture in the Bible, right? Because Abraham was, was the man there that we, we, look, we aspire to be. He's on the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews and all that stuff. And then we find Abraham in the Old Testament in sin. And God said, because of your sin, you're going to take your son. In the Hebrew, it says, your only son, the one whom you love. Take him, Isaac, and bring him up on that mountain that I will tell you. That's all the Hebrew now. And he says, when you get there, when you get there, sacrifice him. And Abraham can't believe it. How, what are you talking about, God, really? And I know for a surety, when I read that text over, I don't see Sarah anywhere in the text. Because if I was to go to Melania and say, I'm taking my son and I'm going to go and sacrifice him, she would stop me. So I know what a mother was, must be thinking, so he's not going to be fool enough to, foolish enough to tell her. So he takes his son, goes up on a mountain, and Isaac doesn't even fight. So can I come back to this now? Yes. That was a beautiful picture in the Old Testament, but it was pointing to something in the future. And that's what I'm showing you, even from Genesis. Everything was pointing towards the future for someone to come who is the lamb. Now, now you're the lamb. So, so here's the dirty sinner. Sorry, Marvin, but you're a dirty sinner today. Now, Marvin is a dirty sinner. He just did wrong. And he doesn't know how in the world he's going to fix it. And because of sin, sin demands that death must come. Does it not? Yes. The wages of sin is? Yes. Death. So therefore, Marvin, you now are a low-down, dirty sinner. And you came now to the sanctuary. And he's walking to the sanctuary. His head is down low like some of us today where our head is down low. Because we're just feeling so guilty of all the stuff that's been going on in our life. Oh my, I've sinned again, I've sinned again, I've sinned again. And you come to church and you're like, man, I don't even feel like my guilt is coming off my shoulders because I'm I just, I just supposed to leave it here, but I pick it up and I walk out again. But that's the beauty of the sanctuary. That's the beauty of it. That when we come with our guilt, when we come with our problems and our pain and our pressure at work and at home and at school and everywhere else, we bring it to the sanctuary and we lay it down and we say, leave it here. And you walk out and you, you raise your hands because you've been free. That's the beauty of coming to church. Now, you're a low-down, dirty sinner. You, 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 you came to church now, but you found out that there are some stuff that you did wrong. And, and you're guilty for it. Now, now, because the law demands that, that you've got to go and find a lamb, you went and you found a lamb. You found a lamb. That's a sac the sanctuary service now. You found a lamb. And he brings the lamb to... The sanctuary. Does he not? Yes. When he gets to the sanctuary, what does he do? What does he do? Well, the priest is already there, and here's what he's going to do. Marvin, the priest is there. Here's the priest. You go ahead and you take the lamb to the priest. 
Isn't that beautiful? He takes the lamb to the priest. This is my sacrifice. It doesn't even suffice. Now, now let me tell you, there were different types of sacrifices. Now, now, not only that, people who were extremely poor, who couldn't afford a lamb, they had to bring a dove, similar to, similar to a newlywed couple. Mary and Joseph, we all know. What was their sacrifice? A dove. Now, their sacrifice was a dove because they were poor. So it tells us that when Jesus came into the world, he came to poor parents who didn't have anything. And so all they had was a dove, and they didn't have to lay their hands on the dove because you could, if you let go, the dove is going to fly away. So you have to hold the dove. And symbolically now, what would Marvin do? Because he's a sinner in the sanctuary service. He would take his hand. He will place his hands on that lamb. And in, in, in a symbolic sense, he's now transferring what? His sin onto the, the lamb. Now, after he does all of that, the priest now, the priest, priest takes a hold of this, this poor little lamb. And what do you think the priest does? The priest is the one sacrificing? Absolutely not. And here's where many people make the mistake because sin has got to cost something. What I missed before is that you couldn't just bring any old lamb. Some people think that they can give God anything even to this day. And the truth is that you can't just give every and anything. Some people bring some beat up stuff sometimes to the church and I'm wondering what in the world are you doing? Do you not know that's like equivalent to giving a broken lamb? A, 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 a lamb that has cancer or something in it and you know it is bad but you're still trying to give it to God? God only takes the best stuff. That's why the temple, they spent so much time and laid in the temple with gold because God requires the best. When we come, even, let me, let me take this thing off. When we come to church, when we come to church, folks, some folks, some folks think that even in the service it's like a joke. Listen, before I even stand here, you know how many hours of prayer, how many hours of study, how many hours of reading it takes for one message? When we come, even if we're doing the most menial thing that we think is menial, it is in the presence of God. And we do everything. We can't give lame sacrifices to God. If we come to church and we're not even prepared, that's a lame sacrifice. If we don't take the time out to prepare for our service, it's a lame sacrifice. We do everything to the best of our ability. Even if others may not appreciate everything that we do, it is still to the best of our ability. We give our best to God, and that's what he required. Now, now here's the thing. He puts, he puts his hand symbolically. The priest says, oh, that's so nice, but here is the knife. And he would take the knife. Why would he be the one taking the knife? Because he's the one doing the killing. Because sin has got to cost something. It costs because you can't just bring any old lamb. You give whatever you have. Everything is given to the Lord. And so he gets the best of the best. He brings it and now because sin costs something and you see the effect of your sin because sin always comes with a cost. Not only financially, sometimes emotionally, sometimes sexually. It comes with some types of costs. It comes with diseases sometimes. But whatever the sin is, you know that God is still able to relieve it. Amen. So here's the thing. He takes his knife and he slits the throat of the lamb. <laughs> now here's the beauty of the, of the service. Sometimes now, after he has done all of that, the priest now takes this lamb and he goes into it. They're in the, in the court. He goes and he, and he takes this, uh, the blood. He has to collect the blood from the lamb. Now, some say that he puts the lamb on the, he hangs it on the, 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 the horn of the altar. But sometimes they actually put a stake in the ground and hang the lamb on it so that they'll collect the blood. Are you still with me? Yes. So now he's taking this, this thing. Who does that remind you of? I want to stop here. Because do you, want, do you see the picture? Because when the, when the blood is on the, when this lamb is hanging from the stake, it is Jesus Christ stretches his hands out on the stake. That's, that's now his blood is being drained for each and every one of us. So now he, he goes and he takes this, this lamb. He takes the blood and he goes where? He goes into the holy place. He goes into the holy place and in the holy place there is the what? No, the most holy place has the ark. In the holy place there is the, the altar. Yes, there is the altar. He goes in 
he goes into the, he takes the blood and he goes into now the holy place and he takes that blood and he begins to sprinkle that blood on the veil off in front of the veil of the, of the temple, in front of the veil of the most holy place. Now he does that twice a day. Can you imagine the long lines of people? So you have all of these priests who are in there working tirelessly. They're washing, they're washing their hands in the lever out in the court. And guess what? You know that all of those things are a symbol for Jesus Christ? Because in the lever, there is water. But when they're filled with, when they're working with blood so continuously, almost all day long, what happens to the water? The water gets bloody. So there is blood and water. And guess where the lever itself is located in the, in the sanctuary? Right by the side where Jesus was wounded. My friends, you got to go back and look at this thing. So, so where, when they plunged his side, what came out? Blood and water. Because there you find blood mixed with water continuously. That's what you find in the sanctuary message. And now he goes, and now once a year, once a year, it's called the Day of Atonement. I know I don't have much more time. Can I just have a few more minutes? Once a year is the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement comes... And I could give you all the text, but I'm, I don't have time for all of that right now. But the Day of Atonement comes, this priest has got to do something. What they do, they go out, I need two more individuals. Two more individuals. Two more people. Two more people. Can you just please come? Please come. Just two more people. Thank you. Thank you. Need one more? All right. And I need a strong man. Demitar, I know. I need, a, I need another strong man. I need another strong man. Well, is that all right? I, I, know, I know I'm taking up a little bit of your time today, but I'm working with something here. So we have a strong man. And on the Day of Atonement, this strong man brings in two goats. <laughs> Sorry, guys, you, you didn't know, you didn't know. You didn't know. And the two goats are there on the Day of Atonement. Now, how do they know which goat belongs to God and which is Azazel's goat? Because there are two goats. One has to belong to God and one belongs to the devil. Azazel. Now, how do they know which one belongs to whom? They draw lots. And so they cast lots. And so we say, let's say the lot fell. Rock, paper, scissors, okay, sure it works. <laughs> But they cast lots, and suddenly they find out that who is the Lord's goat? Demetar is the Lord's goat, so therefore now Grigori is Azazel. Lord have mercy. Now here's the funny thing. The strong man would take these animals here and would, would remain. They will take the Lord's goat. Now it can't just be just any priest. It had to be the high priest. So I need a high priest. Someone who can be a high priest. Come on, high priest. So the high priest is here. Here is the high priest. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. You may be seated. We're moving on now to the, to the, to the, to the heavy-duty stuff. We have, we have here the high priest. And the high priest now takes the Lord's goat and sacrifices the Lord's goat. He takes the blood, the same process, and he now takes that blood, and where does he go with it? Where does he go with it, folks? Into the most holy place. So he walks, come walk with me, you're going into the most holy place. So he goes into the most holy place, and what does he do in the most holy place? Because he's cleansing the sanctuary now. What does he do in the most holy place? He sprinkles the blood where? On the mercy seat. And when he does that, do you know how powerful that is? Because that means the sanctuary for all the sins that have been done throughout the year. Now all of a sudden, all of those sins are placed on the seat of mercy. So we are now sin free. Because it's on mercy, which represents Jesus Christ now taking our sacrifice. His blood is sufficient. This is the Lord's goat. His blood now has been placed on the mercy seat. All of our sins who have been confessed is there on the mercy seat. And the priest comes out and he says, now who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. 
And he walks out of there and those who have been committing sins have been washed clean away. But if you have never, never confessed your sin, your sin is always going to be with you. Stay with me now. This is the very interesting part. I told you that it talks about the sin and that it takes care of all of that. But I also said that it tells us about es the eschaton or the last days and what happens. Here is the beautiful part. Jesus Christ is that lamb. He's that lamb. And when we sin, the Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So he is the lamb who is slain for the foundation. And now, Jesus Christ, when you look at it, when you look at the eschaton, now we're talking eschatology now, Jesus Christ went we know that he was the suffering servant. We know he didn't say a mumbling word. We know he was like a sheep. God was brought to the slaughter. We know that he was bruised for our transgressions. He was, he was bruised for our transgressions. We know all that stuff. But now we get to Revelation. And, and we find that Jesus Christ is somewhere after he had gone to the cross. Where do we first find Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation? Where do we first find Jesus? What is he doing? He's in the sanctuary where? In heaven. And what is he doing? Walking among the candlesticks. Revelation chapter 1 and, and verse 13. He's walking among the candlesticks. That is the sanctuary in heaven, my friends. And that is where? That is not in the most holy place. It is where? In the holy place. So we find that at Adventist, we know that did, that did not happen until 1844 where he shifted from one compartment to the next. Where his ministry went from the earth, went straight into the holy place where he was ministering for us. But he's the high priest. He's not only the priest, but he's the high priest. So he couldn't, didn't have to shift to somebody else. No, he is the high priest. So he now took our, our sin. And he goes into the most holy and it is there that he's able to plead on our behalf. And guess what? The Bible says that the day is coming in, in, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. It says the day is coming where Michael shall stand. And my friends, when Jesus Christ stands up and declares like Revelation chapter 22 says, 22 and verse 11 I believe, says that, that, that he who is filthy, let him be filthy still and he who is holy let him be holy still it's the same thing the priest used to used to issue back then in the sanctuary service and that means that there is no more intercession for mankind so if you're holy you're gonna be holy and if you're guilty you're gonna forever be guilty now that is a sobering thought because that means that happens just as that means that probation is closed the seat of mercy is now done mercy and, and, and the intercession for man is now forever for forsaken forgiven for forgotten and Jesus is on his way back to get his own people that's the beauty of it in terms of revelation now, in three more minutes, if you would give me that. What happens when Jesus Christ comes back and he takes his people? What happens when he comes back for us? We know there's the millennium, right? And Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 3 tells us that, that there's a strong angel, an angel that comes and he grabs hold of the... And put a great chain on him. Right? And he's led and he's left there because there are no one there to tempt because we know the people that died. I covered that in a former sermon. And now everyone is dead pretty much. The good and, and is taken up to be with, with him. We're taken to be with Jesus Christ. But those who are wicked are going to be slain by the brightness of his coming who are alive. And those who are dead are going to remain dead. So the devil doesn't have anyone to tempt on this earth. And so he is now roaming about in the wilderness. Now watch this. Coming back to the sanctuary service. After the priest does all of that and the door of mercy is closed, he asks for the strong man. Thank you, thank you, uh, God's lamb, because you have been God's goat and you've been, you've been, you've been uh, slain already. And, and, and here's, here's, here's what I learned. How do we know, how do we know today that that symbol still exists for Satan as the goat, as Azel? How do we know? Well, I have, I have a picture up. Because there's, this has been in the media a whole lot. Have you ever seen this? Yes. You've seen this, right? What is the head there? A goat. 
Now this is placed by, by devil worshippers or sa Satanists. I shouldn't confuse them both because they, they try to make a distinction between them. Some say that a Satanist is not a devil worshipper. Yeah, that, that's, you, you got to know that. But, but Satanists now say that this is the symbol that they use. But of course the inverted pentagram, I told, talked about that a while back that you find on so many record, record videos right now, uh, or, or those, those videos that you know those music stars have, you find the inverted pentagram on all of those things. But coming back to this, this is the head of a goat, and it's still being used today to represent the devil. Still being used. It's nothing new, folks. In fact, they just had a big, big gathering in Detroit. I wanted to put up the picture, but it was so devilish, I just said, forget it. Because they had people who were now, and put horns in their head. Because they, they had such a mass crowd that came to witness. They have one in, in I believe, uh, Oklahoma that they fought because they said if the Ten Commandments can be placed on the courthouse, then certainly they should be able to have a monument for Satan. So they placed this thing in, by the courthouse. And so now we have the Ten Commandments. They said if it should remain there. And now some of them have, have pushed the Ten Commandments out and left the monument for the devil. But the head is still of a goat because it hasn't changed throughout history. It is still Azazel, the goat, they call it behemoth. Now, they try to make it more appealing because they added children there so children can come and sit on his lap and take pictures. But it's still the same thing. It is still Azazel, which is the scapegoat. And the strong man, now the priest coming out, will lay his hands on that goat. And it is not that the goat is carrying the sins of the people because we know that, 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 that the sins, our sins, were sacrificed with Jesus Christ on the cross. But he's transferring the sins symbolically of those things that have been wrong and the devil has got to die because he has tempted people so many times. So Azazel, by the strong man, takes that goat and leads him out into the where? Into the wilderness. And does he kill him? Does he kill him, folks? Absolutely not. Why does he take him out into the wilderness? He lets him go in the wilderness because he knows that he has a time coming when somebody is going to show up and destroy him. Now I want to come back to what I just told you in Revelation because where that fits is that, thank you so much, priest. Thank you so much. Where that fits, where that fits, and I'm going to get very serious now in about two minutes and then we're done. Where that fits is that you see in Revelation itself where the devil is like that scapegoat, where he's led out into the wilderness to roam about. And then the Bible says it's for a short time. So we know that it's, it's a great thing because even though he's roaming about, seeking to devour God's people, all that stuff, even now, we know that it won't last long because he is a defeated foe. And in that time, when he gets up, he defeats, when the people get up after the millennium, he defeats them and he deceives them so quickly because he has time to profess all of his new tricks. And he's able to get them so quickly. But we know that the time is coming when Jesus Christ comes back, not the second time, but the third time. He's coming back as a righteous king. And when he comes back, He's not coming back as a baby. He's not coming as the, 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 the baby that was born in Bethlehem. No, he's coming back as a judge to destroy those who destroyed God's people. And that includes the devil. Yes. Now simply, here's the thing. I don't know what you've been going through, but this message gave me hope because it's through the sanctuary message that we as a church, it's very unique to our church. This message is not like any other from every other church that you go to. But we as a church believe this thing. It falls in line with the 2300 days. It falls in line with the state, the state of the dead. It falls in line with the Sabbath. We see the Sabbath, and I didn't even tell you all of that because you see it in the Ark of the Covenant. Let me come back to it. You find three things inside of the Ark. I told you that before, right? And so you find the Ark. In the Ark of the Covenant, there is the Ten Commandments. And why do we still worship God on the Sabbath? Because of the Ten Commandments. And if you're not a Bible believer, if you are a Bible believer, but you're not worshiping on the Sabbath day, then the ark is still in, inside of the ark is still the tables of stone written with the finger of God as a reminder that His commandments need to be kept. That's why it's in the ark. Then the second is the bowl of manna. And why does He put a bowl of manna there? 
He puts a bowl of manna because it's a covenant with his people that he told each and every one of us through his word that we shall never go hungry. So here's the good part where I was celebrating because even though some of us might not know what tomorrow holds and our finances might be a little bit short right now and we're thinking, man, how am I going to make it? The bowl of manna is a representation that God is still faithful to his people that he still comes through at a time when we think we can't make it and he always provides. He's like Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. He's still there even though we can't even think sometimes we can't see him. But he listens to our needs and he's able to show up and provide manna in due season. Amen. Then, then you find that he, is, he, he presents inside of the ark. There is something else, which is the staff of Aaron that budded, is it not? Yes. And why is that there? I question, why is that inside of the Ark of the Covenant? Because we know that the, the commandments are there, we know the pot of manna is there, but then you find Aaron's staff that budded. And that's because God is telling each and every one of us that he can still work with our rotten selves. Even though we're, we feel like we've been dead, like a dead stick, he still can find life in that. He can still work and produce life in something that everyone else has given up on. He can still produce life where everyone else thinks it's dead. That relationship, that marriage that people think are de is dead, he can still produce life out of it. He can still produce life out of, out of you when you think as if I, I, I'm just depressed, I'm about to give up. He says, no, 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 I can still work with you. Yes. I can still do something with you and I can make you life again, alive again and make you work for me again. That's the beauty of it. I was jumping up and down with all of that. But not only that, he points us to the cross. This message points us to the cross where we see Jesus written all over the thing. And I don't even have time to even go through all the different stuff in the sanctuary. But everywhere you look in the sanctuary, there is Jesus. Amen. Everywhere you look in the sanctuary service itself. I didn't even show you the picture. But the picture itself of how the priest would go from one compartment to the next actually forms a cross. So you see Jesus written all over it because he is the bread of life. Everywhere you look, you see that he's sufficient. And there is nothing that we should need as a church because Jesus Christ is our everything. And his blood is sufficient. He is the lamb. But not only the lamb that was slain, he is the risen lamb. Because he was able to conquer the enemy. And he's able to give us freedom for tomorrow. And we can be assured that if Jesus conquered him, certainly we too are declared righteous because we accept him. Today, my friends, I just want to have a word of prayer with you. I know we, we're over time. I just want to have a word of prayer with you. For those who have never given their life to God, I'm going to ask you, I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you to give your life to him. You've been brought here for a reason, and God knows exactly who you are. And you've been brought here for this moment to give your life, to surrender your life to him because he can still work again in your life. So I don't know what you've been through, I don't know what the challenges are in your life, but I know that he'll provide for you. I know that he can work life where everyone else thinks it's dead. And I know that once you believe and trust him and, and honor him and follow what he's written in his word and do his commandments, that he has promised that he will be there for you. So today folks, would you mind? If you believe God's word today, can you stand with me? Can you stand with me? Father in heaven, Lord, I'm not going to belabor this moment. But through your sanctuary service, oh God, we're given the encouragement to know that in spite of the things that we're suffering with now, that you have taken care and paid the price for each and every one of us. So I ask, oh God, that you will hear our cries today. Those that came in here and felt the burdens of this life, may they feel the relief that you bring. For those who have cares, right now wondering if you're able to work things out in their situation lord give them the encouragement to know that you are god and you still sit on the throne the light in the sanctuary never goes out because you're always present so i ask oh god that you'll be present in every person's life here under the sound of my voice those even listening online if they have never experienced you never surrendered their life to you may they change right now oh god for those you have brought here today before the end of today oh god may they surrender to you May they tell one of the elders, may they tell even me, oh God, that they need to surrender their life and give their life through baptism. 
And in the end of today, oh God, may we continue to praise, glorify, and worship your name for all the things that you have done, for being the slain lamb that is risen from the foundation of the world. Bless us now, oh God, and keep us close to you. This we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 300.